In March 2023, OceanGate Chief Executive Stockton Rush and his wife Wendy flew into London from the US. This wasn't a holiday, it was a trip to meet the Darwood family, to convince them that despite rumours about safety, Ocean Gates' Titan submersible was safer than crossing the street, and diving down to the depths of the ocean to see the Titanic wreck was the trip of a lifetime. This is the story of what happened next. Welcome to Maritime Mishaps. Forty-eight-year-old multi-millionaire Shahzada Dawood was the UK-based vice chair of the Pakistani chemicals to energy conglomerate Engro Corporation and heir to one of Pakistan's most successful business dynasties. He was also a board member of King Charles's charity, Prince's Trust International. After personally talking to Shahzada, his wife Christine, and their two children, 17-year-old Alina and 19-year-old Suleiman, about the design and safety of the submersible, Rush convinced them to participate in the next expedition due in June 2023. Years before, Christine and Shahzada had become fascinated with the Titanic after visiting an exhibition in Singapore in 2012 on the 100th anniversary of the ship's sinking. After the family visited Greenland in 2019, they became intrigued by glaciers and icebergs. Christine later found an advert for OceanGate and originally intended to make the trip with her husband. However, their expedition was delayed due to the pandemic, and by the time they made plans to book another dive, their son, Suleiman, was old enough to go, and Christine gave up her place to him. Suleiman was studying at the University of Strathclyde and had just completed his first year. On June 14th, just 12 weeks after the meeting in London, the British-based family caught a flight to Toronto and St. John's, Newfoundland, to join the expedition. Stockton Rush, French Titanic expert Paul Henry Najolet, and 58-year-old British billionaire adventurer Hamish Harding joined them on the dive. 61-year-old Stockton Rush was president and founder of OceanGate and the driving force behind the mission to the Titanic wreck site. He oversaw OceanGate's financial and engineering strategies and provided the vision for developing crude submersibles capable of diving to thousands of meters. He had an impressive career, and in 1981, he became the youngest jet transport rated pilot in the world when he obtained his DC-8 type captain's rating at the age of just 19. He was also involved in developing several other ventures and was a wealthy entrepreneur who believed adventure lay at the bottom of the ocean. His fascination with the Titanic wreck possibly stemmed from his wife, Wendy, who is the great-great-granddaughter of Macy's co-owner, Isidore, and Ida Strauss, who were passengers on Titanic when it sank in 1912. They were the couple seen in the 1997 Titanic movie who chose to remain on board and can be seen led on their bed together as the ship went down. Hamish Harding was a 58-year-old British billionaire and chair of the private plane firm Action Aviation. He was a well-known adventurer, pilot, and skydiver and was inducted into the Living Legends of Aviation in 2022. He also previously worked with the Antarctic luxury tourism company White Desert to introduce the first regular business jet service to Antarctica. He made many trips to the South Pole and in 2016 accompanied the former astronaut Buzz Aldrin, who became the oldest person to reach the Antarctic, aged 86. Harding also entered space in 2022 with Jeff Bezos's Blue Origin company. Paul-Henri Najolet was a 77-year-old former French Navy commander known as Mr. Titanic. He studied the Titanic for 35 years and was involved in several submarine expeditions to the wreckage and hundreds of hours of observation. In 1987, he was part of the team that brought up a series of objects from the wreckage. Najolet described the wreckage as a time capsule where life suddenly stopped, which is endlessly fascinating to so many people for different reasons. Each passenger, or mission specialist, as OceanGate called them, paid $250,000 to fulfill their dream of becoming an underwater explorer and one of just a few people in the world to witness the wreck of RMS Titanic. Take a look at what was on offer for the passengers. 
There are five individuals can go on each dive. Uh, three of those are what we call mission specialists. So those are the folks who help finance the mission, um, but they are also active participants. So why we are not a fan of the tourist term is because these are crew members, and we teach them, uh, you know, how to operate the sonar, how to operate the communication systems, um, how to uh, do the photography and run some of those. And then when they're not diving, they're on the surface and they're helping. You know, collect the data from before, uh, potentially you know, prepare things like batteries for the next mission, uh, provisions and the like. So it's a very much part, you, you're part of the crew. It seemed the only requirements to join the expedition were the ability to board small boats in choppy seas and be able to sit for extended periods of time. The training given before the dive was minimal and included vessel orientation and a safety briefing on how to don a survival suit. So basically, as long as you were fit, healthy and mobile, you could climb into the submersible and travel 3,800 meters below the ocean to view Titanic. Titan. The submersible the group would be traveling in was Titan, the world's only carbon fiber submersible capable of taking five people 4,000 meters underwater. The state-of-the-art vessel was designed and engineered by OceanGate in collaboration with experts from NASA, Boeing, and the University of Washington. It made its subsea debut in 2018, and the 2023 dive would be its 14th mission. OceanGate boasted that through the innovative use of modern materials, Titan was lighter, more spacious, and more comfortable than any other deep diving submersible exploring the ocean today. However, what they failed to mention was that the sub was not approved by any regulatory body it was not registered as a US vessel or with international agencies that regulate safety, and it wasn't classified by a maritime industry group that set standards on things such as hull construction. In fact, it was built using parts from RV supplier Camping World and was controlled with a 2011 Logitech gamepad controller. According to many experts, it was a disaster waiting to happen. So why was it allowed to operate in the first place? Because Titan dived in international waters, OceanGate was allowed to operate without regulations. There's no real international standard when it comes to submersibles, and ultimately no regulatory body that could act upon people's concerns. Stockton Rush was aware of the concerns, but was quite vocal about his belief that regulations can stifle progress. Mission begins. On Friday, the 16th of June 2023, the Polar Prince, a former light icebreaker and boy tender for the Canadian Coast Guard, left Newfoundland with 41 people on board, 17 crew members and 24 others, including the five Titan passengers. Because Titan lacked propulsion, the ship tugged the submersible to its launch point. Aboard the ship, there were briefings and scientific talks, as well as discussions about the wreckage and the expedition. Those preparing to make the descent were told to wear warm clothing and hats, as it could get cold at deep depths, and to stick to a low-residue diet the day before the dive, including not drinking any coffee the morning beforehand. This was to limit the need to use the toilet, as the facilities on board were basically a bottle to urinate in, and a camping-style toilet behind a curtain. They were also warned that the descent would be in total darkness, because the headlights were turned off to save battery power for when they reached the seabed. Although they were told they would likely encounter bioluminescent creatures during the dive that broke up the darkness. For entertainment, the passengers were reminded to load up their phones with their favorite music to play via a Bluetooth speaker during the trip. It wasn't going to be a comfortable trip, despite what Rush said, because although the cylinder-shaped cabin was larger than most submersibles, it was still cramped and could only seat five people. Everything was set and ready to go. On Saturday, the 17th of June, Hamish Harding posted on Facebook, due to the worst winter in Newfoundland in 40 years, this mission is likely to be the first and only manned mission to the Titanic in 2023. A weather window has just opened up and we are going to attempt to dive tomorrow. On Sunday, the 18th of June, a little later than expected, at 8 a.m. Eastern time, the submersible started its voyage to the Titanic wreck. The five passengers clambered into Titan's cramped confines. 
the pilot and four passengers sat awkwardly against the inside of the hull, whilst engineers bolting the craft closed from the outside. From now until the end of their dive, the five of them would be encapsulated and essentially trapped and separated from the world. It was expected to take two and a half hours for Titan to reach the bottom of the ocean. Via a floating platform, Titan moved down into the choppy waters of the North Atlantic. The white, tube-like outline of the sub quickly disappeared beneath the waves, beginning its slow descent through the dark ocean depths as it started its journey to the world's most famous shipwreck. From the mothership, Mrs. Dawood and her daughter Alina waved off Shazada and Suleiman on their adventure of a lifetime, happy to see father and son bonding over Father's Day weekend. She knew how excited they were and that her son had taken a Rubik's Cube because he wanted to break a world record. He planned to solve the Rubik's Cube at the bottom, next to the remains of Titanic. All seemed well. However, communications with Titan were lost, just one hour and 45 minutes later. It was a further eight hours before the crew aboard the Polar Prince alerted the US Coast Guard that Titan was missing. The time delay was puzzling, as typically, an emergency situation is called when three consecutive scheduled communications are missed. Although because Titan had previously experienced communication failures, it seems the crew weren't immediately concerned. The vessel used a crewed system that basically communicated with the surface ship through text message. So when they lost communications, they did not assume the worst, and were probably waiting for Titan to surface at the end of its scheduled voyage. But when they were unable to locate the vessel, they realized something had gone wrong. Titan also lacked an emergency radio beacon that could have floated to the surface and started beeping if there was an emergency situation. It seems that Titan had nothing in place to alert anyone on the surface or ashore in the event of an emergency. The delay in alerting the Coast Guard was immediately criticized by experts who claimed it might prove critical to the chances of a successful rescue. The search begins. As soon as the US Coast Guard were alerted, they started a search 900 miles east of Cape Cod in collaboration with the Canadian armed forces and commercial vessels in the area. However, the task was huge, trying to locate a 22 foot long submersible in an area twice the size of Connecticut with waters two and a half miles deep was not going to be easy. And with the lack of an emergency radio or a dedicated recovery system on Titan, it was like trying to find a needle in a haystack and time was ticking. By the time the loss reached the media, it was estimated that if the vessel was still intact, Regardless of where it was, the crew would run out of oxygen in approximately 63 hours. In the era of 24-hour news, the search and rescue operation started playing out against the clock. Few events capture the public imagination as much as a real-time people in danger story, and it's hard to imagine a more intense or unpleasant danger than being trapped in a tiny underwater capsule, possibly two miles below the sea, slowly suffocating as the oxygen supply runs out. As experts weighed in on what that would be like, the waiting world monitored every news headline with thoughts of the unthinkable horror the five men faced. However, as long as there was a chance that the men were still alive, there was a powerful urge to search for them. So when, on June 21st, news came out that surveillance vessels had detected underwater sounds at 30 minute intervals for two straight days, it gave everyone hope that the men were still alive Periodic banging is a tactic taught to stranded submariners to assist rescue searches. And experts hypothesized that Najolet, formerly a diver with the French Navy, would know this. However, despite the positive update, it still evoked in the mind the almost unbearable torment of being trapped in a confined space at the mercy of the seas and the slim chance of a rescue. Although the world seemed gripped with the morbid fascination of such a dire situation, there was also a genuine feeling of hope likely helped by the fact that the submersible was on a dive to visit the wreck of the Titanic, which added a romantic poignancy to the drama that was unfolding, and similar to when Titanic sank in 1912, with the loss of more than 1,500 lives. The front pages worldwide relayed every update. When James Cameron waded in on the situation and said he believed both incidents resulted from captains ignoring safety warnings, it added even more sentiment to the story. 
With seemingly little information, the search teams split their efforts between the surface and the ocean's depths. Alongside US and Canadian authorities, commercial deep sea firms, private vessels, military planes, and a submarine joined the hunt. Ships and aircraft scoured the surface visually for signs of the sub's white hull. Whilst beneath the waves, rescue ships pinged the ocean with sonar to detect the craft. The most significant concern for rescuers was Titan's structure. Titan was an experimental carbon fiber vessel, unlike most submersibles, which have a spherical pressure hull made from steel or titanium. It could mean the craft would be fragile during recovery, or worse, it could have failed altogether. France's sea ministry diverted its Atalante vessel, which was equipped with a subsea remote operated vehicle to assist with the search. If the ROV found the sub, its remote controlled cutting arms could free it from tangles and help bring it to the surface. Five surface vessels were also searching for Titan. More underwater robot vehicles were due to arrive on the morning of June 22nd, but they were desperately late to join the hunt. When the underwater search gathered momentum, Titan's passengers had less than 12 hours of oxygen left. Titan was estimated to run out of oxygen at around 7 a.m. Eastern on June 22nd. Then came the news everyone had been dreading. By 11.45 a.m. Eastern time on June 22nd, the search was over. The US Coast Guard announced that an ROV launched from the offshore vessel Horizon Arctic, which had arrived at the search site the night before had found remain to the Titan. It seems that Titan suffered a catastrophic implosion at the moment it lost communication with its mothership, when simultaneously, the transponder signaling its position also stopped working. From the start and throughout the rescue operation, Christine Doward and her daughter remained on the Polar Prince. She later said, we all thought they are just going to come up, but she lost hope when 96 hours had passed since her husband and son had boarded the submersible, which indicated they had run out of oxygen at that point, she sent a message to her family saying she was preparing for the worst. Her daughter, on the other hand, remained hopeful until the call with the US Coast Guard. It's hard to imagine what they went through during the search period. Christine and her daughter later vowed to learn to finish the Rubik's Cube in Sulman's honor. Shortly after Titan's debris was found, the US Navy revealed that it had detected an acoustic signature consistent with an implosion on June 18th in the general area where the vessel was diving and lost communication with Polar Prince. At the time, that information was relayed to on-scene commanders leading the search effort. However, the sound of the possible implosion wasn't determined as definitive, and so the search and rescue mission continued. It also emerged that Titan had dropped its ascent weights and was aborting the mission and coming up, possibly trying to manage an emergency. A transcript or log of the final text message communications from Titan was published online, although we believe it was fake, so we'll not include it. Implosion. Experts now believe Titan suffered a catastrophic implosion that probably killed its pilot and four passengers instantly due to the intense water pressure in the deep North Atlantic an implosion was the worst possible outcome of all the scenarios envisioned during the desperate round-the-clock search to find the missing sub. An implosion is when the wave of pressure is inward, whereas an explosion is when the pressure wave is outwards from whatever its source. Titan's passenger chamber was protected by a sealed pod and a pressurized gas system. However, the carbon fiber cylinders of the pressure vessel may have given way, in turn causing the implosion. The passengers didn't stand a chance. They would have been ripped to shreds, alive one millisecond and dead the next. In part, the information that they likely knew nothing about what would happen and died instantly brought some comfort, considering the alternative scenario of slowly suffocating. However, despite initial reports that the passengers would not have known what was about to happen, there are now conflicting opinions that they possibly did. Experts suggest that they might have been aware of the imminent implosion just over a minute beforehand, believing that when Titan lost electrical power, it would have lost stability, causing it to freefall vertically towards the seabed with its porthole facing down until at around 8,600 feet, it imploded like a popped balloon due to the rapidly changing pressure. The five passengers would have been piled on top of each other in terrifying total darkness throughout the fall, 
which would have lasted between 48 and 71 seconds. Titanic director James Cameron also believes the passengers would have known something had gone wrong. He said Titan had sensors on the inside of the hull to warn them when it started to crack, so they probably knew that the hull was beginning to delaminate and crack. That would explain why they had dropped their ascent weights and were coming up. Wreckage To date, five major pieces of the submersible have been found 12,687 feet below the ocean's surface in a large debris field close to the bow of the Titanic. They have been recovered for analysis. When they were brought to the surface, the pieces were surprisingly big and recognizable as belonging to Titan. Among the debris, the Coast Guard revealed it may have also recovered human remains within the wreckage. This was a shock to many, as officials and experts were initially skeptical about the prospect of recovering any of the bodies. The implosion was thought to have been so violent there would be no remains. So what went wrong? It is now well known that long before the disaster, questions were raised about Titan's unconventional design and its creator's refusal to submit to independent checks that are standard in the industry. There weren't just concerns about its carbon fiber hull, but also its shape with experts believing that a cylindrical hull like Titan's was a bad idea. A sphere is best suited for a submersible because the water pressure is exerted equally on all areas. Titan's larger cylinder shape did give more internal volume for passengers, but also meant it was subjected to more external pressure. The water pressure at 12,500 feet is roughly 400 atmospheres or 6,000 pounds per square inch and is likened to the force of a whale biting on somebody. Despite Titan having inbuilt sensors that could withstand high pressures near the seafloor, any defect could result in a near instantaneous implosion in less than 40 milliseconds, and that it seems is exactly what happened. Pressure hulls should be made out of contiguous material like steel, titanium, ceramic, or acrylic. These materials are easier to analyze for damage and determine how many dives the craft can take However, with carbon fiber that is made of two different materials blended together, the risk of microscopic damage going undetected is much higher, meaning it could get progressively worse with each dive, causing it to eventually fail. By building a first-of-its-kind submersible using a carbon fiber hull, Rush wasn't following the naval engineering rulebook, and by ignoring safety warnings, Titan was becoming brittle after being exposed to repeated pressurizations and unlike a steel or titanium hull that may bend over time, indicating that a repair is required, carbon fiber breaks with no warning. In addition to the experimental hull, its surface escape hatch being bolted from the outside with no way of opening from the inside should the vessel surface in an emergency was also unusual, as was text-based communications with its mothership, as opposed to industry standard acoustic beacons. Titan's minimalist interior and seemingly improvised off-the-shelf components also did not follow proven standards for diving to extreme depths. It's since been revealed that Titan only reached the Titanic's depth on 13 out of 90 dives, so it was far from reliable, with just a 14% success rate in the deep sea. Did Ocean Gate know Titan was a death trap? OceanGate was certainly aware of the dangers their submersible posed, as its passengers had to acknowledge a four-page waiver form before boarding the vessel, which stated the sub was not approved by any regulatory body. The liability waiver also included the term death as many as three times just on its first page. It listed the number of ways passengers on a trip to the Titanic could die. They included being subjected to extreme pressure or any other failure of the sub, unpredictable conditions such as oceanic or atmospheric, and boarding small vessels and other equipment. Other risks of death covered in the waiver include being exposed to high pressure gases, pure oxygen servicing, and high voltage electrical systems. By signing the waiver, passengers also gave up the right to take legal action for injury or any other loss. It makes you wonder why anybody would step foot inside the sub in the first place, as it sounded like they were signing their life away. Aftermath In 
In the aftermath of the disaster, it was revealed that in 2018, David Lockridge, OceanGate's Director of Marine Operations, was fired after raising concerns about Titan's experimental carbon fiber hull before its maiden voyage. In a subsequent lawsuit over his dismissal, he wrote that the hull could subject passengers to extreme danger. He had noted that he had seen visible flaws in the hull's carbon fiber that could develop into larger tears after multiple dives, raising the risk of the hull failing. OceanGate addressed the flaws by developing an acoustic monitoring system to listen for the sounds of the carbon fiber hull failing. If these telltale sounds were detected during a dive, the system would alert the sub to return to the surface. However, Lockridge was unconvinced, saying, this type of acoustic analysis would only show when a component is about to fail, often milliseconds before an implosion. It seems that sadly, he was spot on. Past passengers also shared details of problems with Titan. During a test trip in April 2019, Carl Stanley, a submersibles expert, heard loud cracking sounds that indicated pressure was crushing a defect in the hull. Rush subsequently altered Titan, built a new hull, and postponed expeditions. However, since Titan's maiden voyage to the Titanic wreck in 2021, those on board have detailed communication, navigation, and buoyancy issues during their 12-hour round trips to the seabed. Other potential passengers pulled out over safety fears, but OceanGate was the only operator providing tourist trips to see the Titanic wreck. And for people chasing extreme adventures, it was a dream come true. The mystery and romance surrounding the Titanic story drew people in, and for those who could afford it, it became a must-do dive. There were, and still will be, people willing to risk their lives to see the iconic shipwreck. There will always be companies like OceanGate that look for new ways to make money and fulfill the craving for extraordinary and unusual expeditions. Stockton Rush was a man who was obsessed with the watery graveyard of the Titanic, and stubbornly believed advances in material science meant his new type of submersible, which went against tried and tested standards, could provide the room and flexibility to take paying tourists to a place very few people will ever see. You can't help thinking that Stockton, Paul Henry, and Hamish were aware of the risks, as they were seasoned adventurers known for their extreme activities. However, for Shahzad and his son, it's hard to tell if they knew the danger they were putting their lives in. A crucial part of the investigation is likely to focus on Titan, and whether the vessel was always destined for disaster because of its unconventional design and its creator's gun-ho attitude that ultimately cost him and four others their lives, adding to 1,160 bodies that were never recovered from the Titanic disaster over 100 years ago. For Stockton Rush's wife Wendy, she now has both her great-great-grandparents and her husband resting in a watery grave thousands of feet down in the North Atlantic Ocean. It's worth remembering that submersible disasters are extremely rare, and vessels are built to last, thanks mainly to the certification protocols that almost all such vehicles follow, except Titan. The question is, was it worth it? Our thoughts are with the families of those affected by this avoidable tragedy. We cannot imagine the suffering they went through during and after this horrible event. Thank you for watching, and we'll see you next time.